Mac Power Users, episode 525, Workflows with David Wayne. Hello, everyone. This is David Sparks, joined by your pal and mine, Mr. Stephen Hackett. How are you doing, Stephen? I'm good, David. How are you this, uh, it's not really spring yet, late winter day. Oh, it's a great day. Is it? The weather is beautiful here yeah. in California. Oh, California, blah, blah, yeah, blah. Come yeah. on. You got to come out. You got to come out here, man. Um, but we have a guest today. Welcome back to the show, David Wayne. I'm in California, too. Oh, two Davids, both in California. This is very overwhelming for me. But but David is a New Yorker, right? Do you, I, has California grown on you yet? Or are you still missing New York? I I wish I could say I I'm still getting used to California. I live now here in Los Angeles for about seven years or almost eight years. Um, but I like it. I like the weather. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Well, uh, gang, if you don't remember David Wayne, he's been on the show several times in the past. He's um, world famous uh, producer, director, writer. He's done a lot of shows. I first discovered David when I was a Jungle Cruise skipper and I would sit in the cast activities office at Disneyland and wait for my girlfriend to get off shift in the middle of the night and I'd watch the state. And that's that's where I that's my roots with David. But he's done a lot more. Uh, numerous Our audience movies. was mostly Jungle Cruise skippers. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> hey, you know, it, it was very targeted, but very well done. That's all I can say. Uh, a lot of folks know Wet Hot American Summer. It was a movie and then it was a Netflix series. Uh, Wanderlust, which was um, I think the, was that the last motion picture you did? Uh, no, there was, um, they came together, came after Wanderlust, uh, and okay. then there was another one called A Feudal and Stupid Gesture, uh, which was a biopic about the guy who founded National Lampoon that was oh, uh, on nice. Netflix. And then, and then you've also currently got on Netflix, uh, Medical Beliefs, which I love. I love that show so much. Thank you. Yeah. It's a kind of a extension on Children's Hospital. Yeah, we had a, another show, Children's Hospital, that was on Adult Swim for seven years, and then this is uh, another iteration of the show, but uh, it's a, a action adventure, Mission Impossible, James Bond kind of genre, and it's a one ongoing story for a whole ten episode season. Yeah, imagine like twenty four, but way funnier with yeah. doctors and and, and, way, guns. and way dumber, even dumber. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the uh well i promise we're going to talk about technology today but there's one thing i have to say okay so in children's hospital the joke of the show was always that the hospital was in brazil and the um and i think rob told me at one point he like got enough money from the network to go down there and shoot one scene in brazil or something yeah it was always a one-off throwaway joke that we kept very consistent and loyal to from the entire for the entire run of the show that the hospital which is clearly a bunch of Americans in an American children's hospital, but we just said it's in Brazil randomly. And um, then one season we had two doctors going out for a snack and walking around outside. And we shot that one minute segment actually in Brazil. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and then, so now, so now medical police kind of grows out of children's hospital. You have to see it. To, I don't want to spoil it for you, but the, uh, but it feels to me like you guys like got that Netflix money. You did some serious Brazil shots this year. Yeah, we actually shot a few exterior shots with body doubles of of people driving in Sao Paulo, but we didn't go there. We <laughs> okay. hired we the, you know, it was a lot of tech involved actually. We had hired a a camera person down there to, to do it with a similar car. Um <laughs> but we really, you know, you you say Netflix money. These days Netflix money can mean a lot of different things and yeah. our budget for this was actually not not a huge budget, um, yeah. but we pulled every trick in the book to make it look like uh, 15 different countries, even though we were only in L.A. And actually, a quarter of our shoot we did in Croatia. It's amazing. And uh, gang, well, so I'll, I'll make the pitch for it for the Mac Power users. Uh, David is a fellow Mac geek, and he made something very funny. If you have Netflix, watch Medical Police. But uh, what we want to talk about today is all the technology involved and how you're using your Apple tech and how things have evolved. The very first appearance you did on our show um, was you, you went through one. I don't remember which, which movie or show you went through at the time, but you went through kind of the production uh, workflow and the Apple tech you were using. Yeah. And it's just, it's been so many years. I know a lot of it's changed. And I, I guess one thing we should start with is how has your gear changed in the meantime? 
Well, as far as hardware, not too much. I have a MacBook Pro, which I replace every couple of years. I guess I have the late 2000, mm, I'm checking, but it's, um, I have a, oh, I have a 2018 MacBook Pro 13 inch, yeah. um, which I got to say, you know, it doesn't hold its charge at all. And as you know, you can't get Macs to, you can't replace the batteries anymore. Yeah. Uh, or even repair them or anything. So I'm just screwed. And I went to the uh, store and they're like, yeah, there's nothing we can do. Um, and then I started looking for an external battery pack that works well with the MacBook Pro and I couldn't find one. I actually bought three and struck out on each one. They None of them really had the power to really charge this thing when you needed it to. Yeah, I think you could probably get one for a MacBook Air, but the MacBook Pro has such a power draw. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. So I just have to carry a cable around and be uh, plugged in no matter what. And when I'm running around set or something, it can get very challenging. Uh, that's frustrating. Um, Steven, I don't think, I know there's an app for the 15-inch MacBook that will turn off the video card, but I don't think there's a separate video card in the 13 inches there. No, there's not. It's all uh, just the Intel graphics. So you're kind of you're kind of limited as far as, you know, bring maybe the power consumption down to where a, a battery could could charge it but man that that's that's pretty crummy service <laughs> on that store's part i would yeah i would hope that that apple would would make that right for you i mean i gotta say as a as a, a mac enthusiasts for in my entire life i do feel like they have been slipping in various areas in the last several years and it's it's disappointing well you know this this segment i get uh complaint emails from listeners saying why you keep bagging on Apple? And all it is is when we have guests on, we have a segment at the beginning to talk about what gear they have. And now it seems like everyone starts with, well, my keyboard is broken or my batteries. I, it's like everybody's got a complaint. It's not that we're trying to solicit problems with Apple, but it seems like a lot of people who use their Macs for important work are, are having trouble, and especially the laptops. I think it's hard to deny that their attention has gone towards iOS and those devices. It's just, there's no way around it. Have you looked at the Mac, the new MacBook Air? It's pretty powerful. Maybe that would work for you. And I bet you could charge that off an external battery. I should take a look. I, um, I had started uh, using a desktop. I, for a while, I was using three Macs. I have a, an iMac at home and I had a desktop that I was using at work that wasn't mine. And then I had my laptop for when I was in between. Now I'm back to using my laptop everywhere with an external monitor. I mean, when I'm at work. And so I don't even remember what your question was, but. <laughs> yeah. I was just talking about the Mac. I mean, you don't actually do the video production on your laptop though, right? I do do some. I actually okay. do. I do some editing and I do. Uh, I, I do. But I do yeah. my main full on editing on an Avid which is part of a Mac desktop system at the office. The, uh, when, they, when they update the keyboards in the smaller MacBooks, I'll email you. I'll let you know to go look. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <don't, laughs> We're all holding our breath. Don't do it before then. <laughs> yeah, don't do it before then. What was the name of that actor, the guy who was in, um, uh, that was in The Mandalorian? He was one of the directors, and he just won an Oscar, and he just went off on Apple and their keyboards. Oh, what yeah. <laughs> Taika Waititi. Yeah. yeah. He's right. Yeah. yeah. I know, man. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to say. And they're still selling those keyboards. So how long is this going to go on? Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I don't use, I try to use the external keyboard as much as I can because I'm, I'm I don't love this keyboard. Yeah. All right. So gang, before you email me, this wasn't planned. Okay. It's all right. <laughs> take Take a deep breath. It's okay. Apple's going to get there. I think I think they actually are on the road to recovery with their laptops, but I suspect it takes a, a while to kind of re, like re you know reset the assembly line, the designs, and all that stuff. I also have never understood this idea of being opaque about what's coming next. And you know, I know they've yeah. gotten a little better in some ways, but just you know, help us out here. Yeah, it, you know, if they would just say, "Hey, um, we have this new keyboard in the 16 inch is going to be in the 13 inch in the MacBook Air by the end of the year. I guess nobody would buy laptops. That's probably why they're right. doing it. But at the same time, they kind of created the situation. They kind of owe it to us. I also just think there's basic OS things that they could have fixed 15 years ago that I've been waiting for them and they never, ever do. And they just keep adding features without fixing the basic features. 
Um, An example to me is global hotkeys that conflict with each other. There's no way to just open up something that says, here's all of the ones that have been assigned by various apps or various services on your computer. And that seems like the most basic, easy thing that should happen, but they can't do it. You know, nobody's ever mentioned that, but that's a great idea. Yeah. I mean, it seems like the most, and there's no, there's no third party app that does this either. And then another one is the, if you're, if you've, you know, travel around a lot and you're, uh, you have maybe 50 different Wi-Fi networks that are in your list, there's no way to search that list or easily organize it or take out the ones that don't matter anymore. It's just a mess. These are just examples. I love the Mac. No, no, I know. It, it, it's to say, you know, we all love the reason we complain is because we love recently I had, I was at my sister's house and I had to write a legal brief on a windows computer cause I didn't have one and something came up and wow, man, yeah, uh, it made me like my Mac. Again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, uh, are you, have you gone any way down the iPad road at this point or are you just all laptop? I, I love my iPad and I use it all the time at home, mostly for con- consuming. Um, yeah. but I do, I do use procreate, uh, more and more, uh, sometimes for work where I'll, I'll use it to, uh, make an animatic or a visualization, but I feel like I've yet to be convinced that there's a real advantage in most use cases for using the iPad versus the Mac for anything work related. Well, I mean, you, you are definitely a power user. I think that like, I look at, I know people in my life who are not power users and they've made a transition to iPad with no problem whatsoever, but you're yeah. doing real serious work and you know, there are certain things that are just, it's just the, the bar is too high. And sometimes it's not even possible to do some of that work on the iPad. But using the Apple pencil though, for certain kinds of annotating scripts and stuff is very, is a very cool way to do it. And I have done a little bit more of that and I love it for fun things. Like I, I do a lot of drawing using the camera Lucida app where it kind of shows you where to draw. And it's really, really fun doing that. Yeah, I've always felt like I'm kind of team both. You know, you don't have to be Mac or iPad. I mean, there's certain things that are just better on the iPad, but not everything is better. And if you can, if you're lucky enough to have both, then use the right one for the right circumstance. Yeah, but I find that sometimes the differences are so infuriating, or when something is clearly more figured out on the on the iPad, and you but you need it on the Mac. That's where I get very frustrated. For example, I know you were talking was last week or something about all the family stuff. Yeah. And in my case, it's been the opposite of seamless. I, I, I find that the, the screen uh, time limitations and, and stuff, the, the, the Mac, and when you make those changes on the Mac versus the iOS, the, first of all, the interface is completely different. The way it's set up is completely organized differently. And it's inconsistent. And it, it, it's just truly frustrating to try to use. And and another example is if you want to con- talk about your subscriptions that you have signed up for on iTunes, it still opens up the music app to deal with all of your app subscriptions on the Mac. And you have to open this app just to check your account, which is absurd. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I, I like guests that have opinions, David. This is good. <laughs> Yeah, this is an opinion show. <laughs> yeah, no, you, I think you're you're totally right. There's so many things where the Mac and iOS touch where it's like it's on unequal footing. I think screen times are a good example where it's just like really kind of broken on the Mac. And not to say that it's perfect on iOS or the iPad, but like sometimes I go into that preference pane on my Mac and like it just doesn't load or there's no data. And it's like, well, I promise you I've been using my computer all day and it just hasn't done any data capture and I restart and maybe it's there. And that sort of thing definitely is grading over time. If you're going to bring these platforms closer together then the parts that overlap, I think they need, I think you you should respect the strengths of each platform, but the feature should be the same. Right. And, and they should work. If they're touting to have the same feature when I'm at work, I love to, when I'm at work, I love to put my phone away so that I really am just focusing on what I'm doing at work. And then sometimes though, I have to pull it out because there's something that I know doesn't really work the way it's supposed to on the Mac. And that's where I get frustrated. Which phone are you using? Um, it's called iPhone. It's by Apple. <laughs> I figured that. Um, which, which one? I have an iPhone 10. Yeah, okay. And it's fine. I have no major complaints. 
how has that phone held up over the last couple of years? I know a lot of people sort of in our circles upgrade, you know, every year, every couple of years, but the the vast majority of people don't actually do that. And so how's it been with an iPhone 10 now coming up on, on what it's like two and a half year mark or something? I guess so. I, I really haven't, interestingly, that one, no complaints. Um, I use it every day, all day, and I, I, I haven't felt any yearning. I'm mm-hmm. sure I, will, of course, will upgrade at some point, but um, usually I upgrade the phone when I'm sick of the old one, and this one I'm not really sick of, and I nothing's gone horribly wrong with it. So um, not an interesting answer, but that's the truth. <laughs> you're you're going to get such a nice camera upgrade when you do. I mean, because you've waited a few years. Um, yeah. Uh, I just, just this weekend, we were looking at comparing my 11 to my daughter's 10 in photos. We got a new puppy, so... Oh, you nice. Know, taking a lot of pictures. But the uh-huh. uh, but it's just amazing to me how much better the new camera is in low light. So when, when you know, next September, whenever you get the next one, you're, you know, that's the benefit of waiting is you get to see the difference. I do like how the camera and the um, microphone in the iPhone is better than most cameras and microphones in existence 10 years ago. And um, I use the, one of the things I do in production is, if there's a, a line of dialogue that needs to be changed when you're editing is I just record it on the iPhone or I ask an actor who's in Chicago to record it on their iPhone. They email it in. We stick it right in the sound mix. It all happens so seamlessly. It's great. Wow. <laughs> That's something, man. By the way, and you'll see in feature films all the time, extra lines that are supposed, you know, you're supposed to do ADR recording in a sound booth with the whole thing. But so many of those lines actually come from actors just doing it on their iPhone from their trailer on the next movie. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And I have a great app called rec up where you say a line and then it, without doing anything, it immediately uploads to a certain folder in Dropbox. And if I share that folder with my sound mixer, um, I can just say, here's a line and then that not even push a button. And then he's got it already in his mix. Hey, you know, you, you see there's not really a huge market for third-party microphone add-ons on the iPhone, and I think that's why, because it's just so good as it is. Nobody yeah. really needs to plug a microphone into it. Yeah. That's impressive, though. I didn't know that. Do you guys do any kind of post-processing? I mean, what if they t- record it well, in a noisy room? or There's always um, – er- everything gets goes into a sound mix, and so yeah. – uh, any uh, talented sound mixer can take different audio that's recorded in different ways uh, and try to match it and make it sound the same. But usually when there's in a scene where there's other sounds and there's background sounds and perhaps music, uh, it it becomes more forgiving. Sure, sure. All right, well, I want to talk about medical police, but uh, let's hear from a sponsor. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Bowl and Branch the folks who make the softest organic sheets and luxury bedding. My wife and I received a set of queen-size bowl and branch sheets for our bed, and they're incredible. The unboxing experience was top-notch. Came with this beautiful box that you untied, really nice presentation. And these are the best sheets we've ever had by far. They simply feel incredible. Bowl and branch products are made with uncompromised quality, and attention to detail is built into every step. They're meticulously crafted from pure 100% organic cotton. They're such high quality because of that organic cotton. It's long staple cotton, which means bold and branch sheets will get softer over time. They're honestly so soft that they're the only bedding loved by three U.S. presidents. And if you didn't already know, bold and branch are really awesome when it comes to ethical manufacturing. All of their factories prioritize workers' empowerment and sustainable incomes. 100% of the packaging used is made from recycled paper, and they're the first manufacturer of linens to be fair trade certified. You really need to give these a try. Shipping is always free, and you can try them out for 30 nights without any risk. And right now, you can get $50 off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com and the promo code POWERUSERS. So go there now, upgrade your bedding, you won't regret it. That's Bowl and Branch, B O L L and branch.com promo code power users. Our thanks to bowl and branch for their support of the show. So, so David, it's been a long time since we talked uh, about it, but one of the things I love about your career and, and talking to you is that you do the whole enchilada. 
you know, you come up with the idea, you pitch the script, you get it, you know, you from the first idea of a show to the post production and release, you're involved with all of that. And um, and I just wanted to hear how things have changed for you since the last time we talked. And I thought it'd be fun to do it around this new show. Sure. Well, every time I embark on a new project, this one I did with um, three other partners, Rob Cordry and John Stern and Christopher Johnson. And we uh, are always saying, let's not just do things the way we always do them. Let's think about how we can make things better and what's been invented that can improve the workflow in any way we can. And we did it this time too. Um, but there's certain things that have evolved for us that we've stuck to. But right, like for example, when we're doing script writing process, we still have to do this round trip thing where we write in final draft and then we output that to an RTF and then we upload the RTF to Google Docs. And that's how we can all make suggestions and comments on the drafts as a group. And that works well, except for that we have to keep doing those round trips. And then somebody has to go back and transcribe all of the changes back to the original script. It's truly um, another area of friction for me that I feel like is techno, you know, technically not necessary, but no one's invented the right workflow to make it work. Yeah, it seems like Final Draft still is a bottleneck, isn't it? Well, Final Draft, not yes. True. Yes. Uh, I, and I, if I'm working al- on my own, there's certain things that I feel like if I was completely in charge and everyone did it exactly the way I would want to do it, it would be better because there is that other screenwriting format fountain, which is platform independent and based on plain text. And if it was up to me, we would do everything in fountain. But the problem is there's still no Google doc version of a way to present fountain so it looks like a screenplay which should be the easiest add-on in the world yeah. but somehow no one's done it and there is this company called writer duet that does something like that but they're still also not quite ready for prime time yet i don't think i mean when we first started talking google docs was a unique snowflake i mean it was really the only document app on the internet that you could have two people simultaneously editing in. But now there's Quip and a bunch of other competitors. I feel like the technology has been democratized more. So it seems like this is a solution that should be there for you guys. I mean, that's a big enough industry. And I've tried some of the other ones. I'm, I have yet to find one that is as reliable and uh, yeah, that, that makes sense as much as Google Docs and that just works as much as Google Docs does. Um, but I'd be curious to see. Yeah, Rob was telling me at one point you guys would have even like a system where you'd have different colors for each writer so you could see who was making the changes. It depends on how you do it, because if it's a script now, we don't nobody writes in the doc. Once the script is up there, everyone just uses Google comments or Google suggestion mode, which is great because it automatically puts a date and identifies the contributor without anybody having to do anything. But depending on what the note stock is, we're always changing it depending on the context. It's sometimes easier to uh, assign yourself a color to write in the doc. That's how we do sound notes, for example. But um, also that's another area where I wish Google Docs, the only way to do that quickly is to assign different headings for each person. But then you run out of room because there's only six headings allowed. I just wish things would, they would allow you to to customize more when you want to in any, in any app, you know, I always just scratch my head about apps like final draft where they own the industry. There's a couple like that in the legal field too. And one of them I'm thinking about right now, if you look at it, it looks like a windows 95 app. It's just like they refuse (laughs) to evolve. Yeah. I've been in touch with final draft over the years, trying to get them to make certain changes and they have done some things, but it's so, so slow and so little. And I agree with you. I mean, the main app that we all use for editing, Avid, uh, has many aspects that feel like 1995. Although they have just more very recently released a new redesign, which I haven't checked out yet. I'm curious to see. Yeah, and it's like they they own the industry, but they could lose it because everything is evolving. And some someday somebody's going to you know do that, and they should be the ones to be doing it. I, I don't understand the logic of it, but I guess they're making money and. It's hard to justify making changes. I, and the other flip side is there's people out there that if you change the slightest thing, they lose their minds. Yeah, but A, 
they can always keep the option to run it the retro way if you want, I suppose. But more than that, it's like that should not be a reason to not evolve something. Hmm. For those who may not be familiar, what's sort of the elevator pitch for Final Draft? What does what kind of tools does it give you that it brings to the table? Yeah, that's it's it's the app that you use on your Mac or now your iPad, I believe, um, to you can write in screenplay format, which is a very specific format of indenting and sizes and everything uh, seamlessly where you don't have to keep formatting each line. It's designed for screenplays. So as you type along in a somewhat intuitive, logical way, you can it auto completes character names and so on and has various other bells and whistles. Um, the knock on final draft over the years is that, as we just said, it doesn't evolve over time and they, they keep very frustrating bugs and features that don't work in for years and years before they finally will fix something, um, or make it more modern like other apps. And, and so that's, that's been the frustration, but it has not been knocked over as the default app for screenwriting. There are other apps, but, um, most places still deal in final draft. Now, what about communication between your team members? You had four people working on this. Obviously, you all weren't in the same room, or maybe you, you did get together to get this whole thing rolling, but how were you communicating as you were developing it? On the last movie I did, Feudal and Stupid Gesture, I really made a push for the team to do Slack, which I thought was a very logical way to not just have torrents of emails and texts all mixed and matched all over the place and have all the communication in one place that people can watch. Uh, and then it was really something we tried so hard, but really failed ultimately because something like that Slack is that, that system where all teams can communicate in one place. If not everyone embraces it, then now you've just added yet another thing, yeah. another thing. And then, some people are like, I won't look at the Slack, so just email me. And so then, so now you have to do triple, double work, and it just became a total disaster. So we gave up on that. And in the last one, we did the normal system of just lots of different various email chains and text chains. Um, but the one thing I did insist on and did work is having a very disciplined set of rules around just making sure that the subject line of an email is about what it's about and not to start a new chain if it's about a new thing. And um, yeah. that worked a lot better. I find uh, text messages in relation to work can be really frustrating because people drop little things in text messages and there's not really a chain on it. And right. it's not that easy to capture always into a task. I mean, I know there are ways to do it, but it's just uh, I completely agree. I feel like text should be limited to immediate question with immediate response. That is not about ever having to look back at it or remember it, or then you, that should be done in email, in my opinion. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I think I probably learned oh, that boy. from you 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just does really create like whenever I have a client email or text or message me a request, it's just like a little part of me is like, ah, now I got to figure out how to remember this and mm -hmm. track it. And well, by the way, don't get me started on iMessage. Oh my God. The, <laughs> okay. the, the Apple messages is still a total mess. I think it, it, it doesn't, it's not quite in sync all the time things get lost you still they they've made improvements but you still can't really search them in a in a real way and they still have the, it says multiple matches when you search on the mac that's one area where i have to go to my iphone to search for messages because it doesn't yeah. really do it the right way on the mac well it, it's it's incomplete on the mac they don't, there's features yeah. on the phone that aren't don't even exist on the mac i don't understand that i don't either so every time you want to send a message with lasers you have to go pick up your phone it's terrible <laughs> Well, I, you know, Steven particularly likes emoji and, and little cartoons of me and I can only send them on my phone. It makes me sad. I can't do it. On <laughs> but my just, phone. I mean, it, it's just, you know, an, an app like WhatsApp, it's just simple things. Like if you delete something, it should delete on the other end too. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's just absurd to me. I, I feel like that's one that it doesn't get the attention every year. It's like a couple of years ago, they gave it a big push when they added, you know, the Memoji and, and some of that stuff, but they, mm -hmm. but they didn't, 
I just assume that like we get it on the Mac within a year and it's been yeah. like two or three years now. The Mac know. app is still like the the burned out hole of iChat, right? Like it even looks yeah. the same yeah. in a lot of places and they sort of shoehorned in the message iMessage service and then AIM and everything else went away. And yeah, it's, I think it's time for the Mac to become a sort of a first party message client because right now it feels sort of haphazard. Like the, my least favorite thing, you know, I've got a laptop I use just sometimes and I boot that thing up, you know, uh, several times a month and it takes 10 minutes and messages are just like whizzing around and I have to like minimize the window because like, why are they physically moving up and down the list as they sync? Like, oh, I know. What I know. are you doing? By the way, while we're on it, photos, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> they still, for me, it's still like, if I want to quickly find a photo, I go to my Google Photos kind of archive mirror because it's my, opening the photo app on my laptop is always going to be a beach ball, always going to be some mess, some problem. I'm I'm pissed. <laughs> I, I feel that fo- the Photos app very much is a mobile first app. I mean, it's clearly yeah. they wanted it. They wanted it to always be up to date on your iPad and your iPhone, and and the the Mac was not. Did not get the dreaming. However, the editing on photos on the Mac is pretty good, but the actual just catch up and show me current photos. Mm-hmm. You're right. right. Every, every time you load it, it's like you go get a cup of tea and wait for it to figure itself out. Plus, your Mac does all this background photo syncing and slows down the entire machine in between it, it, it and you can't control that. By the way, once again, love the Mac. <laughs> I know. I know, man. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, it's just like you feel like uh, I know in my personally, I feel I, I've always been a fan of Apple products. I they bring me joy. I'm able to create great stuff with them. But then you see like little rookie mistakes. And then the problem now is for the long time, it was a startup company like they were like this the underdog. And you said, OK, well, I can forgive that. They, they're trying to just stay afloat. But now they've got like more money in the bank than many countries do. So I feel Precisely. like, come on, you know, come on, just and, and the and the people I've talked to people at Apple about this, and they say, Dave, you you talk about in your podcast like I can just go dial up a hundred programmers. It just doesn't work that way, you know. Mm-hmm. And I understand that you can't throw another hundred developers at an app and it gets better automatically. But and you know, there's a to huge, me, I think you, if you get, but if the like each one of these problems that we've identified, I think you get one person or one small team that's actually paying attention to that and wants to make the change. Um, I say that having no clue how uh, software engineering works, but I'll just say it anyway. (laughs) Uh, So to to rewind a little bit uh, back to the pre-production stuff, you mentioned Google Docs and Final Draft and sort of the the manual work that you have to do to, to bring things back and forth. Do you have any processes in place to make sure that errors don't get introduced in that system, that it feels like it's ripe for uh, mistakes? Well, actually, to me, Google Docs is one of the best error prevention systems we have because like, right now I'm doing post-production on something else. And it's so – I like that there's a, a doc that everyone has access to It's as opposed to, oh, I was looking at the wrong Word doc that someone emailed me last week. You know, There's one doc. It's live. It's on the web and it's the one central place where everything is n- noted. And as long as people embrace that, then it allows for the least number of things to fall through the cracks. Hmm. Um, like right now I'm doing a post-production and there's a music team that's working somewhere else and there's editors and there's a post, there's producers that are in New York and it's all over the place. But anytime anyone needs to see where we are, they look at the one doc and it's live. And I think that's good. And the only place where things get, screwed up is people are like, oh, I didn't look at the doc because I made my own separate list in my own thing. And and that's where I'm like, no, do it our way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I feel like your industry could use a a film, you know, oriented version of Google Docs you know, that really gives you the tools you need. Or just an add-on to Google Docs. Yeah. Because, you know, Google Docs has all these add-ons, but they're all pretty buggy and weird. Um, I think they should, I would love it if they enhance that suite more now you also you said uh, with the medical police that you shot most of it in la but some of it in croatia and how do you plan for something like that uh it was pretty cool because 
we were working very fast on a relatively low budget. And so we were shooting six weeks in Los Angeles and then the final two weeks were in Croatia. So while we were shooting in LA, we would have Skype uh, back and forth with an entirely different production team in Croatia. And uh, we didn't, we, we didn't have time in our schedule to do the normal thing you would do, which is you go and scout all these locations and then you pick the ones that are best for the show and you have meetings with the costume designer and then everybody in the art department, you do all these things for weeks in pre in pre-production from a shoot normally. In this case, we had to do that all while we were shooting in Los Angeles and remotely. And so we did things where they would uh, FaceTime us from a location scout and say, look at this, or they would send us a video that they would make of what they think our, their idea of what our shot might be if we shot it at location X, Y, or Z. And also keeping an ongoing Google Doc about all that prep so that by the end of the day, uh, when we got to Croatia and we were shooting 10 different locations, I think, uh, or more than that, we had 10 shoot days there and we probably had 15 locations. <clears throat> and so we were able to just get off the plane and with one day of prep and quickly driving around to all the locations in one day, we were able to jump right in without any real prep time there, um, all because of the remote stuff. Nice. Nice. So it worked out for you, it sounds like. It was really fun. It was it was exciting to shoot in a foreign country and have all these different kinds of locations. Um, and, it's, and it's a lot less expensive, too. The, um, and then you mentioned Procreate earlier for animatics. I, I have to admit, I'm not sure what that is. Procreate is a drawing and art tool on the iPad, which is absolutely amazing. You, you look it up on YouTube, for example. There, there are just so many great things. Yeah, I'm familiar with the app because you know people do um, like uh, drawings on it. Well, Procreate will also record you over time so you can play back your drawing as a movie. You can also create animations, simple, very easy, like user-friendly way of making animations, which is what I did. I would put a overhead shot of the location or an overhead uh, diagram of the location and then put little icons where the cameras would be and where the actors would be. And then when they would move in the scene or where I wanted them to move, I would just move it around and make a little animation to show the crew what we want to do. It was very gotcha. easy. That's, I didn't know what the word animatic was. Now I do. I learned something. Well, actually, that's not actually that. That's not, just <laughs> so no one gets mad at me. That's okay. not an animatic. That's a diagram that's animated. An animatic is where you actually create a version of what the min finished movie should be in either a piece of software or in animation or with drawings. But you're making a video clip of what the shot will want to look like when you make it. It's like a storyboard that moves is what an animatic is. You know, it's funny when you podcast long enough how the little head, the little voice in the back of your head lets all those people who write angry emails to you seep in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've really got to stop doing that, you know? This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Squarespace. Make your next move and enter offer code MPU at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase. For the longest time, creating a website was a big pain in the neck. You had to get a server company, you had to pick software, and then you had to manage the whole thing. With Squarespace, you don't have any of those problems. Squarespace lets you easily create a website for your next idea with a unique domain, award-winning templates, and more. We hear from listeners all the time that have created websites for their online stores. Uh, we've heard from photographers that use them for their portfolios. I even use it for my blog over at MaxSparky.com. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform that lets you do just that. There's nothing to install or no patches to worry about and no upgrades needed. You don't have to worry about that stuff. They take care of it all for you. And they have award-winning 24-7 customer support if you need any help. With Squarespace, they let you quickly and easily grab a unique domain, so whatever your idea is, you can attach a domain name just for it and do it right in Squarespace. And all of those award-winning templates are beautifully designed so you can show off your great ideas. One of the best things I like about Squarespace templates is what a great starting place they are. But they are not the ending place. Even though you're not a web designer, you can go in and make changes and adjustments to your heart's content I'm doing it all the time over at maxsparky.com and also my legal website. In addition to using Squarespace for my own stuff, I always recommend it to friends and family, particularly people that don't have a lot of experience with a website because Squarespace just makes it so easy. 
Squarespace plans start at just $12 a month, but you can start a trial with no credit card required by going to squarespace.com slash MPU. And when you decide to sign up, use offer code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and to show your support for the Mac power users. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash MPU and the code MPU to get 10% off your first purchase. We thank Squarespace for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. So we've talked some about pre-production, how you communicate, how you work on scripts. Uh, let's move into production. How do how do things how are things getting made here in the year 2020? There's a lot of traditions of how how shoots happen that have dated back to the turn of the century, a uh, hundred years ago, uh, um, in terms of the the protocol on set um, and the hierarchical way it goes from the director and the director of photography and the assistant director. A lot of that stuff is good. Some of it is antiquated though. Um, one of the things that's changed a lot is VFX are so much cheaper and easier in some cases that you can really adjust how you shoot uh, in a different way. For example, you know that if you're shooting on 4K video, you can blow up the frame pretty easily. So if something, if a boom mic is sticking into the frame, you can just go in a little tighter when you're in editing and then not worry about it. And when you're shooting fast, sometimes you have to, you can say, you can notice a mistake in a shot you're doing. And instead of doing it again, you know, you can fix it later. And so you can move on and it allows you to shoot more. Hmm. So you can erase that boom mic or you can erase that person that walked into frame that shouldn't have, or you can take two takes of two people talking, even if they're in the same frame, but mix them and match them later much more easily than you could have done in the past. And so that's, that's one of the many tricks we would use to make a, a low budget show look like a big action movie on medical police. Um, and then we did a lot with, a lot of times when you're doing a driving scene, for example, they'll have a green screen behind the car and then have a video of the street moving outside the windows. In our case, we just got big monitors and put the monitors outside each of the windows of the car, plus one above the windshield to make reflections. And so when you're shooting, the thing you see out the monitor is exactly how it's going to look you don't have to do this process later of adding in something with a green screen. And it looks much better in my opinion too. So that was one of the new things we have been doing. And sometimes another thing we did on another recent shoot, which was so funny is we, we had a set that's an exterior of a building, but we wanted to shoot someone in one of the scenes where if we had shot the angle of this person talking, you would just see that you're on a soundstage. So we just took a photo outside of the regular street blew it up big, put the photo behind the person, shot it with a lens so that it would be out of focus, and it sold perfectly. I know that's like not a, really a tech thing, but... You no, know, but it's cool because um, it just seems like it's democratized a lot. Like, things that used to be super difficult now with technology get a lot easier. Yeah. Another thing we did for years, I would carry around a director viewfinder, which is a small device that has a bunch of... has a lens inside that you can adjust to get an approximation of what a different size lenses might look like when you set up the camera. Um, but now they have an app called Artemis on the iPhone that does the same thing quite honestly better. And it mimics the look and feel of all different lenses that you program into it. And then you can immediately text the photo to your collaborator or whatever. It's very good. I mean, you, you call medical police low budget, but they jump out of an airplane in the first episode. I mean, <laughs> well, we actually, um, that was, a, a the, we found these people in somewhere in California who I took different YouTube clips of, of skydiving pieces that I saw in a various different movies and then drew in pictures where that, where it didn't exist to tell the story that we wanted to tell of exactly what happened in the skydiving sequence. I sent that Google Doc to this company, these guys basically who skydive and wear GoPros and can shoot shots of themselves skydiving to fit into your piece. And then they did it. So that's how we we just outsourced <laughs> those shots. And then the close-ups of the actors, some of this is on my Instagram, I think. And the close-ups of the actors were shot um, 
with that with the TV screen behind, like I was saying before, uh, just screaming like, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And then we put it all together with sound, and it it really does sell. Yeah, and the landing is awesome. I'm not going to say I don't want you to say anything more about it. I just want <laughs> yeah. people to watch it. That was the one of the most low low tech practical effects ever. <laughs> But uh, so uh, that's cool, though, that you're you're getting more out of that. The um, you also talked about shot shot list aesthetics are changing for you. Well, I mean, <laughs> so uh, some directors, when you're shooting, have a um, a list of their shots they're going to do, and and some people, some directors keep that to themselves, or they just keep it in their head. They don't write it down. I'm the opposite. I like to like write big lists and make sure everyone sees it, so we all know what we're doing. And uh, sometimes I'll spend quite a bit of time just uh, adjusting the font or making making the layout look really nice. <laughs> yeah. and, that's, and that's why the MacBook Pro's with you, probably. Yeah. And people are like, can we start shooting? I'm like, no, I just need to like change the color of the heading of the time when we're going to lunch and you know, put a little icon of a fork and knife at lunchtime. I think it'll look cooler. Um, that's where you get caught up in the fiddling. Yeah, but but I when when actually when I'm shooting is the only time I do put all my devices down and I I carry a clipboard or a folder with a with a paper printout of what of everything that I need the script and the information and shot list um, because in the in the rhythm of an actual shoot day when so much is happening I actually just want to see a piece of paper in front of me now now what's the go to font these days when you're making this list that's such a good question it keeps changing. But uh, I do off. I, I usually round back to classic Helvetica a lot because uh, ever since that documentary came out, I keep it keeps becoming the default. But then I change it up. What's the name of that Avatar font that everybody uses? It's so ugly. Um, oh, I hate it. Yeah, uh, it's Papyrus. Um, papyrus. Yeah, papyrus. Yeah. Papyrus. No, I make sure. Sometimes when people send me a list, uh, still to this day, people are like, "Here's a list of." actors blah, 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 and it's in comic sans i'm like oh no i'm i'm i'm, I'm sorry i won't read this yeah <laughs> there, there was an app i forget which one it was it was one of the powerful text editors where if you didn't pay for it it just went to comic sans until you paid for it <laughs> oh that's really funny i forget what app that was that's a great in-app purchase uncomic sans your work <laughs> I love that. <laughs> There's a great SNL skit about papyrus that I'll put in the show notes that always makes me yeah, laugh. I love that too. Yeah. Uh, I but it's like for whatever reason where I live, everybody wants to use it in their like um strip mall store signs. Papyrus is like it like invades everywhere. Mm. I know. It's so gross. <laughs> uh, and and they're making more avatar movies, so people are gonna like it more. Oh boy. I don't think so. <laughs> What went to that decision to print the stuff off and have it on a clipboard or a folder, just that it's easier and less distracting or. I just realized that for me, like there's a certain point where I don't want the electronics. Like I just, I still have, what I do is I set up a little desk on the set with my laptop so I can access things as plug ne- it in. as needed <laughs> yeah, and plug it in. Exactly. <laughs> and I have my phone and stuff, but I, you know, I just don't want to run off my little tiny screen off a phone or carry around my laptop. I just want to actually now, I just want to see it printed. It's there. It's not going to change. It's not going to turn off. It's just, you know, and I can write with a pencil during if, if someone is, um, I also created something called Wayne sides, which sides are the printed out uh, scene that you're going to shoot that day. And they usually get printed out from the shooting script. And so that you have to flip a bunch of pages in order to watch one scene go by. I reformat them so that all every scene fits on one page. So you don't have to do page flipping while you're trying to rehearse or act out a scene. But basically when something's shooting or rehearsing or something, I like to scribble with a pencil or circle something um, without having to deal with any electronics during the time when I'm trying to pay attention to what's happening in front of the camera. Yeah. I don't think I've ever said it on the show, but when uh, in, in the legal racket, um, when I examine witnesses, I do the same thing. I spend a lot of time in Omni Outliner creating those outlines for those witness examinations. But when I'm right. standing in front of the guy in the black robe, I, I print them out and put them in a binder. Although I will say when I'm on the other side of something, when someone's, if I'm talking to a doctor or anybody who's taking information and they're writing longhand, I get scared. I'm like, why don't you have a computer? <laughs> Just a thought. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by 1Password. 1Password is my go-to tool when it comes to creating strong, unique passwords. And the best part is 
They're available to me across all of my devices. My, my MacBook Pro, I can log in with Touch ID, authenticate right there with Safari. From my iPhone or iPad, I can use Face ID. It's really cool because security shouldn't slow you down in what you want to do. And Natural Bits really works hard to make sure that one password works for you. Here at Relay FM, we use one password for business. It starts at just $7.99 per user monthly when billed annually. And we use this internally. So Mike and I can share a bunch of passwords we need for the business, but we have different vaults set up for different team members. So our sales manager can log into things she needs, not necessarily everything that we have. We can organize all that from a central place. And you get really great support. So if I ever have any questions, I can get one-on-one support from 1Password, which means a lot when it's time to run my business and keep my business secure. If you head on over to onepasswordcom slash MPU in all caps, you can learn more and sign up for a free 30-day trial. Once again, that's onepasswordcom slash MPU. When you sign up, you get 20% off. My thanks to One Password for their support of the show and keeping my business safe and secure. All right. Uh, you want to move on to the um, post-production stuff? Sure. So... Uh, then uh, after we finish shooting, we'll we get into the editing and uh, still the the you know, the company that makes the main editing software is Avid, and they own the software that most people use for sound mixing, which is Pro Tools. Um, and yet those two uh, pieces of software still don't really talk to each other very well. Um, and I find that another uh, friction point where you have to. If, if, if we need to take something from the Avid and bring it into Pro Tools or vice versa, it's an, it's an output and a round trip instead of just accessing the same session, mm. which I find absurd. But other than that, um, the way we do post-production on Medical Police or anything else is similar to the, the writing. We, we keep track of everything in Google Docs. We edit in Avid. We do sound. We do music. We try to keep everybody kind of in touch. We have uh, people doing graphics. We have people doing um, ADR recording, um, composers doing music. Uh, and little by little, we've just come up with these systems. Uh, and people who come to our team to work on it, they're always like, oh, I'm going to steal your Google Docs idea. That's great. Bring it to another, you know, as if <laughs> I invented this. But it is good. My whole idea is like we have a, Google Doc that has every scene listed in an episode, say. And then there's notes in everybody's color of what needs to happen. And those are basically tasks. And as soon as something is done to my satisfaction, I erase the note. And so as soon as the list is entirely empty, we know that that pass of something is done. Now, do you work Google Docs on your iOS device as much, or do you just do it on your Mac? I occasionally will look at it on the iPhone if I have to on the go, but mostly on the Mac. Um, they, they, they've done a lot of improvements uh, on how to deal with Google Docs on um, iOS, but they st- it's still not hugely up to speed. And I don't use a keyboard with an iPad ever anyway. Yeah, I, I do feel like Google is kind of dropping the ball on the iPad with Google Docs. Because I, I use Google Docs a lot too. And it, it, there's a lot of friction when you try and use the iPad and Google. Yeah, I just think there's a lot of somersaulting people do to avoid using a laptop when you can just open up your laptop. It's about the same size as an iPad anyway. What hardware are y'all using to run Avid and Pro Tools on? Usually just, I mean, I'm, I'm actually sitting in an edit room right now and there's a trash can here. And that's what a lot of places use. Um, and we've all been waiting since 2013 for the Mac Pro to come out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'll see who can afford one or whether that makes sense for most real life post-production facilities. But a lot of them run off these trash cans. Have you seen many of the new Mac Pros out in the wild yet? Uh, no, I have never seen one. I'm curious. Come by after I'm excited. work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know with, with Avid and, and a lot of those real high-end edit suites that and I think a lot of people aren't aware of this, that you have to work with Avid. So Avid will go out and they will sort of bless you know, update to Mac OS or bless hardware for, and they say, okay, this version of Avid will run on this hardware. We approve that old versions won't. And you really have to stay lockstep with these big software companies. You can't necessarily run out and install 
Catalina on day one because Avid or, or some plugin or something you may rely on hasn't been verified yeah. to work. I know that that keeps a lot of post-production work off the bleeding edge sometimes by quite a bit. And I find that super frustrating because I like to, you know, whenever I sit down at any computer, I load in all of my crap that I've learned over Mac power users for the past 10 years. And when it's not an updated system because they can't because of Avid, I get very antsy and mm-hmm. and whiny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I will sometimes just upgrade the operating system, even though it's not um, approved by Avid, and mm-hmm. just hope for the best. <laughs> I, I'm always interested when I talk to folks that do high end edits, though, about just data management. I mean, you've got musicians and other people working on these files, probably all over the place. How is the data captured at the shoot, and how is it managed on the back end these days? You know, that's an area that I don't know that much about firsthand, but it's like there's now, you know, nowadays when we shoot video instead of film, there's a person whose job only is to ingest the data and deal with it Um, because there's so much data flying. We're shooting 4K video, three cameras, sometimes at once. The the amount of data is just so, so massive. And then when you bring it into post-production, we have a server that so all the data is on a central server in a big closet down the hall, and then all the different edit rooms can access the server. Well, that doesn't sound crazy. I mean, it sounds a lot easier than than I imagined, actually. Well, from my end, on the creative end, it's it's pretty seamless, yeah, unless it breaks down. But it's usually pretty good. Yeah, because you you've had a career that's kind of spanned this technology jump. Yeah, well, I start I started editing on a Steam Deck where I was I would use a razor blade to clip the film and then i would use a piece of tape to tie one shot to the another and draw with a grease pencil a, a, a diagonal line when i wanted to have a dissolve um so it, it started there and it's gotten better since then yeah is there anything that's got it worse well there's a lot to be said for editing the way i just said uh steven spielberg did it for decades after avid came out because there's a lot to be said for thinking twice before you try something or, you know, putting some thought into every move before you do it. And also the idea that you can say to an editor, like, try this and this in the scene, and then you go for a walk and you think about it while they do it. And then you come back and see it fresh. There's, you know, everything has a pro and con, but um, I would say that overall it does get easier and better with each iteration. And also, I do think that the Final Cut 10 uh, is a slightly different whole modality of how to edit, which I think there's a lot to be said for the way that that program works versus the Avid, but it still has elements of it that to me aren't still ready for prime time. What are the hard parts for Final Cut with you? Well, one of them is that there's, there's, there's a thing called script tool on Avid where you can take the entire screenplay that you're working with and then you go to the particular word or line in the script and then up comes every iteration of that in your footage and nice. that's a crucial tool now to to work quickly and efficiently um and i don't think there's an equivalent uh for final cut what is the you know what are the real rough spots for you now in terms of technology in your business I mean, where is technology letting you down at this point well i think i've mentioned a lot of them today so far just when yeah. when the mac doesn't live up to what you wanted to do and i think what was i just saying today in the in the we were having a mix session they're just there yeah, there's always these things where like they they could do this why don't they and and sometimes i think maybe i should get into the development business but i'm already too tired yeah you're a pretty busy guy Dave. <laughs> i know <laughs> you know right now actually we're doing this new show um it's a pilot right now, but it's a daily sitcom. So the idea is we're going to shoot a show each day, post-produce it and air it that night. Whoa. Um, and so all the tricks we're learning are going to go into hyperdrive to try to figure out how to make this happen. Is it, can you say any more about it or is it still? Not really. Yeah. All I right. mean, that, that's stay tuned. Well, let us know. We'll, we'll let the audience know when it, when it comes out, but yeah. So I would imagine for something like that, you really need to have all your technology working for you. Yeah. I mean, but, but I think you have to be realistic too. You have to be, have a, a plan for if something doesn't work or if something shuts down and, you know, 
and also have good people around. See, Stephen did the daily podcast for a while. I don't think that that was a real fun thing for you, was it? It was. Uh, it was not. I mean, not that the work was all that much, but the fact that it had to be done every day uh, wears on you after a while, and eventually yeah. it sort of petered out. But uh, you know, I'm sure it's different too if you're working with a team of people and as opposed to just yourself. True, and I think that part of the goal for this show that I'm hoping we do put this machine together where we're making a daily sitcom, but it'll be like a soap opera where we went to go visit a set of a soap opera and I've never seen a place that's more relaxed and they're often pumping out seven hours of material a week. But I think when you have a machine and then the machine can run and it doesn't depend on any one person Mm -hmm. because it's really a machine. And so um, that's sort of the goal that I have for this show. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Let us know when uh, that pops up. We'll be sure to let people know. I will let you know. I bet you'll have some cool ideas for all your Apple gear too, to make that happen. Once you get rolling big time, I want to, I want to have, I want to be like Francis Coppola used to be and just sit in a control center um, and have eyes on the set on post-production and writer's room and never have to move. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wired into the uh, control panels. Yeah. And just, and just turn on a mic. I did have a new, they had a new gadget on set, which um, had nothing to do with Apple. That was a, uh, a thing where I could hear it was a headset and I could hear the audio that was being recorded through the microphones. And I also in the same machine was in connection with all the camera operators. So I could tell the camera operators what to do in real time. And then I pushed another button and my voice was amplified over the whole stage. So everyone could hear what I was saying. It was kind of cool. Yeah, you just need a, like a green M M&M and M button. Attached yeah. to that. So you press that and they bring <laughs> and you green m and ice, ice, ice tea dispenser out my hat on another yeah. button. Yeah, there perfect. You go. Now, do you wear a, a, a baseball cap? I mean, when you do this stuff, because I, I, every time I see, you know, Ron <laughs> Howard, he's got his baseball cap on. <laughs> well, just like Ron Howard, I too have lost all my hair. So, yes. <laughs> this episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Omni Outliner. Create perfect outlines with this powerful, productive application. I mentioned in the show today how I use Omni Outliner to create exam outlines when I'm in trial. This is the perfect application for this problem. I get lots of witnesses and I build up information over time. So when I'm starting my trial preparation, I'll make a list of all witnesses as level one entries in Omni Outliner. And then every time I learn something new about this person that I want to learn about, whether it's through deposition or trial testimony, I add it to this massive Omni Outline that I spend sometimes years building. When it comes time for the examination, I've got this great outline already built. And then, of course, I can go in and make adjustments. Omni Outliner makes it so easy to move things around. One of the beautiful things about this is because all of the witnesses are on one Omni Outliner document. When I come up with an issue that involves multiple witnesses, I can address all of them at once. I have tried so many other tools to solve this problem, and none of them can do it like Omni Outliner. I know some other lawyers that have seen me doing this and they bought Max for the sole purpose of running Omni Outliner and copying my examination outline method. Now, maybe you're not going to trial next week, but you've got some other bit of information that you need to organize. And for that, Omni Outliner is the tool. Because it's made by the Omni Group, of course, it is easy to use and powerful, but it also looks really good. With Omni Outliner, you can change styling so you can get that outline to look just the way you want it. But don't take my word for it. Head over to the omnigroup.com and download a free sample of Omni Outliner. You can check out the application and just see how great it is. And when you decide to purchase it, let them know you heard about it here on the Mac Power Users. We really appreciate that. Once again, thanks to Omni Outliner for sponsoring the Mac Power Users. David, uh, you do such amazing work, and it's I love talking to you to hear how things are changing in your industry. Sometimes it sounds like it's not changing fast enough for you, but it seems like you find ways to make it work. But also, I'd like to just talk about you as a nerd and, and some of the apps and uh, technologies that are bringing you delight these days. Well, I'll tell you, um, there's so much. You know what I've been using actually a lot lately is uh, the musicnotes.com app on the iPad to play piano and stuff because they can, you, yeah. you, you buy a piece of sheet music and they can slow it down, speed up, change the key. Um, I wish that uh, there's a lot, I have a lot of notes for them on that one too. <laughs> I feel yeah. like there should be a lot more control, but that's been a lot of fun. Um, and, and also the camera Lucida for drawing, but I, I also have been 
as always, as we all do, keep rethinking my my task management overall. Yeah. And one of the things you once said uh, is, and I'm sure you've said this many times, the, the idea of like, no matter how well you manage your tasks, if you have too many, you can't do it. Yeah. Um, and I keep trying to face that. I, there was a great quote I saw on Instagram last week that is, adulthood is saying things are going to slow down next week until you die. <laughs> But I've got a new system that I've been, I've, I've been, I've come back and forth, but always largely stuck with things as my task manager. Yeah. They had a good update a couple of years ago. It's a good app. Yeah. They still do. They still move too slowly for my taste, but uh, too long a story is why, why it's things for me, but it's things. Yeah. And then though I've been using do, which I had tried years ago, um, based on the recommend of Katie Floyd. Um, yeah. But now I, the new version of do the newer version i think is really great as an adjunct to things because no i don't think there's any task manager and you tell me if omnifocus does this that no matter what just keeps bugging you until you deal with it nothing pesters you like do does there's nothing like it and it's so great like to me i absolutely need that for many like the things that i really need to do that day and it turns out there's quite a few of them like you know, you got to take certain medication or like there's, there's a lot of categories of things that I might like, I want it to not shut up until I do it. Yeah. Um, and it does have a quick thing to say, no, do, just wait two hours and then tell me. Yeah. And I find that using that as sort of the daily bug me app in conjunction with things as the larger task manager is something I'm still trying to figure out, but I, I'm enjoying doing that. And then the only other weird thing is, I have one person who works with me as an assistant and I, I want to have a collaborative list with her to give tasks and have her respond and deal with that. And I didn't find that um, things or OmniFocus or do or any other one worked that well until I found Todoist. And so I have that one list on Todoist, which works on the web and works on the phone and the Mac, and it works pretty well. I was going to make fun of you when I saw the three task managers in the outline. But now but it makes I, sense. But, but I, I use Do for taking medication and certain things, and I use OmniFocus, and my assistant and I use Basecamp, so I am just as guilty. You know? There you go. Steven, did, did you have an app that you liked that would bug you, or was that Do for you as well? Yeah, it's it's Do, like you said. I haven't found anything on the App Store that will just hound you until you say that you've completed something. And so I've got some, you know, medication stuff in there too, but it's, I also use it for those sort of one-offs like, Hey, I really need to remember to put this check in the mail today and remind me every 30 minutes until it's done for that sort of like really critical stuff. I turn to do, and it, it's that nagging is just fantastic. And do you know the trick? If you just delete your reminders app from your phone, then when your Siri automatically defaults to do. Oh, nice. So I go, hey, Siri, remind me to do X, Y, Z, and then it does it in do. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, years ago, my wife gave me a hard time. She's like, you know, I shouldn't have to ask you to take the garbage cans out. And she was absolutely right, you know. So I put a do thing in. So every Thursday, I get those cans out before she gets home. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's like stuff like that. So I only have like five things in the app. Yeah. It's, it's stuff that you just, you just want to do it right. And, uh, and it shows up for you. It's good. I've also been using uh, NV Ultra, the the beta from All right. Brett, Team Terpstra, which yeah. I absolutely that's see that's what an app should be. They update it every day <laughs> or a lot, and yeah. and they're always thinking and always responding and always trying to get it right. And it's it, I find it really I love it. So listeners that aren't aware, Brett Terpstra, frequent guest, he's the drinking guest on the Mac Power Users. <laughs> Um, uh, when, uh, he's been working on a new text editor, you know, he had NV alt for a long time. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's got a, a, somebody he's working with now. So he's got, you know, they're working together to make it better and it's NV ultra. And I believe just anybody can get the beta now. If not go to Brett and, you know, hassle them, but don't tell him you came from here. But, <laughs> I don't know. Tell him Steven sent you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But he's got a, he's really, uh, he's really delivering the goods. That's going to be a for sale product at some point. If, if it's, I don't think it is yet, 
Yeah, but, I think um, it's hey. still in beta, but it is this what we've been waiting for for years from Brett, and it's it's exactly what I was hoping it would be. He's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> I just wish they had. I wish he would now make it at iOS as well. Then then we'd yeah. be in really great shape. Well, you know what? I think if everybody supports this app, I think, and he can afford to do that, he will. You there know, you go. It's just a question of, of getting it out there. But you're right. It, it is really powerful. I've been using the beta. I haven't said too much about it yet, but once it gets released, we will talk about it. Do you guys use Marco Polo? I don't even know what that is. I saw it in the list. I couldn't. So great. I, I'm unfamiliar with this app. Marco Polo is basically, it's like texting, but with video in a very simple interface. So it's on your eye, on your iPhone and you just press a button and record hello to your friend. And it's basically, it's FaceTime, but without the real time invasiveness of FaceTime. So I say, Hey, you know, friend, how's it going? How's your morning going? I'm doing this, that, and the other. And then whenever they want to, they can play it back and hear and hear what I said. But if we happen to be on at exactly the same time, then they can watch it live while I'm doing it. And so it's it's in seamless back and forth. So you can actually have a back and forth conversation, but then pick it up without losing track later. So time delayed video talk. That, that's it's a not, great idea. Or not, or not time delayed. If you're yeah. actually watching in real time, all the better, you know? So it, it's a it's a pretty cool... I've I've had a lot of friends who were skeptical and now... Almost everyone I know is on Marco Polo, and it's it's a in our busy lives. It's a great way to keep in touch, and also there's group chat. So, I have, for example, I have three sisters. The four of us are more in touch than we've ever been because we have a four of us group Marco Polo, and every so often I'm just like, hey, here's what's going on with blah blah blah, and you're seeing the face and hearing the voice, and it's a it's a really nice social communication tool. Not really for work, but really nice just for keeping in touch with people. Well, also, you know, text messages are just so one dimensional and exactly like, you, know, I text my sisters all the time, but it does feel like it's missing something. Oh, it's so nice to, it's, it really is. It's, it's like having a group FaceTime, but in a world where you don't have time to really schedule that all the time. And how useful is that for people who are not geeks? Like are your sisters geeky or were they able to figure it out? It's as easy as using Instagram easier. You just, you literally just do it. Marco Polo app on the phone. The only I just wish it had again. I wish it had a Mac equivalent or a web equivalent, but it doesn't. I don't keep up enough with social media. That's something that is. Uh, I just right. never get get to it. Yeah. Well, this Marco Polo has nothing to do with social media. It's just communication between friends. It's great. And the, and the, one of the things I like about it is it doesn't have a social media. It seems like every app wants to also have a social media component to it or something, but in a profile. And this is more just here's your list of who you want to talk to, and you talk to them. Do they have a way to monetize it where they're not going to like use my videos at some point, sell them to, you know, whatever next monolith buys them? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's also like slightly buggy. It's not the most elegant app, but it does what it's supposed to pretty well. Have you ever heard of this app, Steven? I haven't. I, I checked it out in the show notes and it, it looks really cool. Th- this seems like something uh, that would be awesome to keep up with, you know, family or if you have kids off to school or just somebody who you don't get to talk to every day. It seems really cool. Maybe uh, some of the listeners who try it out can let us know uh, how your uh, mileage is with the Marco Polo app uh, by sending some feedback to Mac Power users. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> or you could go to the forums. That would be good, too. There you go. <laughs> David Wayne, thank you so much for coming on and, and catching up with us. And congratulations on all your success. I uh, I just love, you. Uh, you know, stumbling into your content. I, I don't I don't watch that much TV, but I, I'm always so delighted. You're you're in addition to being a Mac nerd, a fellow Mac nerd like the rest of us, your sense of humor just tickles me. That's so nice. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I, I love everything you make. And I and I know a lot of our listeners do too. So everybody go check out Medical Police and whatever this next daily thing is. We'll let you know when it comes out. And and keep fighting the fight for Apple and, and bringing your industry forward. I feel we're like all you're a the, team. We're all, we're guy, all in this man. together. We're going to do <laughs> it. <the> Power <laughs> users. Power users unite. One of these days, you're going to get mad and you're going to like form a software company and it's going to change the industry i just feel like that's like in your future you just don't know it yet i'm so tired but okay (laughs) (laughs) well it's like you'll be guy in the room you don't have to be the one writing the code you just got to get the right people working for you there you go 
Uh, thank you so much for having me. I love uh, checking in uh, periodically. All right. Uh, so we are the Mac Power Users. You can find us over at relay.fm slash MPU. Dave, uh, anybody, anybody here, where should people look for you? Uh, David Wayne, W-A-I-N, inst- on Instagram, Twitter, davidwayne.com. All right. Thanks to our sponsors, Bolin Branch, Squarespace, 1Password, and Omni. And we'll see you all next week.